Hi. I'm firstly assuming to anyone watching this video who's seen the first one in the series. And on that basis, I'll push straight ahead. Now, to make progress, we need to understand what's happening at the interface between the tower and the soil, and in particular, what the contact pressures are. Now, I've already indicated how the tower behaves, but what about the soil? What we really need to know is the sinkage versus pressure relationship for the soil. Unfortunately, this isn't something which is normally needed in civil engineering, so we don't have ready-made theories backed by loads of experimental data. The terra mechanics researchers had to start from scratch. In a minute, I'll show you what the underlying equations are and how the relevant soil properties are measured. But a word of warning. Please don't expect a highly precise and accurate uh, scientific theory. It's not like that. What any researcher has to do entering a new field is they have to propose a theory and check it out and either improve it or if it doesn't work they discard it. The theory we've got does work pretty well within certain limitations and it has stood the test of time. We follow Becker's derivation from back in 1955 and he started by looking at the case of a rigid wheel being pulled through soft ground there's a wheel load W acting down on it, and the wheel has sunk to a maximum depth here of Z subscript zero. And there's a force of R required to overcome the soil resistance. The soil resistance, we have a unit of force here, DN, and this has both vertical and horizontal components. And what we want to know is what this force is at any given depth Z. Now I'll show here the pressure versus sinkage relationship as proposed by Becker in his original research paper. Expanding the equation, we got the ground pressure here and it's given by this equation on the right. Here we've got the sinkage depth which is raised to an exponent n and inside the bracket we've got Kc which is the sinkage modulus divided by B which is the loaded width plus K phi, which is another sinkage modulus. And these three items here are all soil properties. Now a good firm soil will have high values here, which means that at any given depth we develop a high pressure and hence we can support the wheel load. An interesting point to note is that this term here, Kc, is divided by the tread width, which basically means that the wider the tyre, for any given depth, the lower the ground pressure will be developed. I'll be talking more about this a bit later on. So how do we measure the pressure versus sinkage relationship? The methods used in civil engineering are a little bit large and a little bit crude for what we need. Here's a plate bearing test with this hydraulic ram forcing the plate into the ground and everything instrumented. But the same principles can be used. Now we can do the measurements inside a lab using equipment like this. But in order to do this, we are of course working with disturbed soil samples which may not be representative of the situation out in the field. The better approach is to mount the measuring equipment, which is incidentally called a bevometer, on an off-road vehicle so you can drive to the site to take the measurements. Here we've got a bevometer mounted on the rear of a tractor we have the power gram here, we've got the instrumentation here, and at the back there's a couple of laptops to record and to process the data. Now this photo is taken from a very recent paper published by some South Korean researchers, and look, they are still using the Becker pressure versus sinkage relationship. It's still the best equation we've got, and it has stood the test of time. Here are samples of actual pressure versus sinkage traces being done from plates of different diameters. This is the smallest one, 40 millimeters diameter, and this is the largest at 100 millimeters. And you see there is, in fact, a small size effect with the greatest pressure being developed by the smallest plate. The back curve will be fitted to these using standard curve fitting techniques and out of this we then get the soil parameters and these can be used in any subsequent analyses. To look at the equilibrium of the wheel 
we multiply the pressure at any given point by a unit of area and we sum it over the whole of the area which is in contact with the soil. And this will give us the net force which can be resolved into both vertical and horizontal components. Performing this operation gives us this equation here. So W is the weight supported by the soil. This part here is called an integral. Don't worry about it. It just means that we're summing the contribution over all of the contact area. Outside the integral, this part comes from Becker's pressure relationship, but now it's been multiplied by B, the tire width, and also by RT, which is the tire radius. It means that for any given sinkage, we will support more weight as R goes up and B goes up, although R has a greater influence. And conversely, for a given weight, we can support it at lower sinkage. Similarly, we can compute the soil resistance to forward motion of the wheel. The main change occurs inside the integral here, but the factor outside is exactly the same. So it means that for a given sinkage, the soil resistance goes up in proportion to the tower radius and the tower width. Now these two factors also give us uh, additional load carrying capacity. However, there's no free lunch in the world. They also put up the soil resistance. So far, we've only considered the case of a rigid wheel. And this is indeed how a pneumatic tower will behave if the tower contact pressure exceeds the soil resistance pressure which can be developed at the point of maximum sinkage. However, if the soil is sufficiently firm, we will indeed uh, develop a flat spot, exactly as if we're driving on tarmac. And at this point here, shown by the red arrow, the tower contact pressure exactly equals the soil resistance pressure for this depth. If we look at this horizontal portion here, and bearing in mind that the pressure acts normal to the surface of the tar, you see that we're going to get extra load carrying capacity, but without any resistance to forward motion. So maybe there is a free lunch after all. Over the curve portion, we'll get some load carrying capacity and also all of the resistance to forward motion will come from this portion. We want to be operating in the regime where we have a flat portion. For the sake of completeness, I show here the two equilibrium equations for the deformed tar. So this is the weight supported. All I'd like to point out is there are two terms. So the first term here, this is the weight taken by the flat portion of the tar. Very straightforward. That's just the closed form solution. And this is the load supported by the curved portion of the tar. For the soil resistance, there's only one term to evaluate. And this is the resistance developed on the curved portion of the tyre. I've decided to break the video at this point. I know it's quite short, but it's been quite intense. And for the general viewers, it may have been a little bit hard. And if you've lasted this long, well done indeed. For trained engineers, more straightforward. Next time round, we'll jump straight in presenting the results. And that is, of course, the more interesting aspect of this subject. See you very soon.